Well, welcome to this uh, this great evening, uh, this this uh, coming out party, the publishing party of this new book. Uh, it's a great book, and welcome to the Cathedral of Saint John the Divine, part of our faith tra tradition, uh, part of uh, every one of the major faith traditions uh, in in Western civilization and Eastern, uh, mid-Eastern civilization, uh, has to do with being people of the land. And we all share uh, a, a, common, a common interest in Palestine. And we've been fighting over it culturally, and racially, politically, for how many thousands of years? I think the negative side is to say, Israel, Palestine, is an intractable problem. It's a Gordian knot that will never be untied. And that may be true, for all we know. But I don't think that lessens our responsibility to keep going at it. You keep talking about peace. You keep talking about what it means to be a person of goodwill with a neighbor whom you may not like and you may not want to live next door to, but you keep talking, you keep ta silence is deadly. So I am grateful for the contribution that Rashid Khalidi has made in this book to keep the conversation going. So it's good to have you, Dr. Rashidi, welcome, Khalidi, welcome. Thank you all, first of all, for coming. Thank you, Dean Daniel. Thank you, Lisa Schubert, um, for organizing this event. Uh, I'm a little awed to be speaking here, frankly. Um, I think this is the most, the loveliest venue I've ever had the privilege of, of speaking in. Um, the title and the subtitle of my book, uh, I think, give a good sense of its main arguments. It's entitled, The Hundred Years' War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance. Now, I did not write this book uh, for academics or for scholars or for students of the Middle East, though I hope they read it. I wrote it essentially for the general reader, especially for the American general reader, who often has a limited grasp of the realities of Palestine, if not a completely false understanding. Um, for some of the older generation among those readers, uh, the awful book Exodus and the equally awful movie of the same name uh, constitute the sum total of their knowledge of the topic. People who rely on the media probably know even less, um, especially the mainstream media. Let me explain first how I set about countering this limited and often false understanding of the modern history of Palestine. I do so in this book first by describing that the conflict in Palestine is not the way it's commonly depicted, either as a tragic struggle between two national movements over the same land, or even more falsely, as an attempt by anti-Semitic Arabs to foil the just struggle of the Jewish people to establish their own state in their ancestral homeland. Against these largely false interpretations of the history of Palestine, I set the following argument, that what has happened in Palestine over more than a century must be understood as a war waged on the people of Palestine to establish a settler colonial project in their midst. This war was launched not just by the Zionist movement, but by different great powers, Great Britain from 1917 to 1947, the United States and the Soviet Union in 1947 and 1948, Britain and France in the 50s and 60s, and the United States since then. They have been partners in this war. These powers at different times endorsed, supported, and sometimes themselves waged this war on the Palestinians. Now, one of the things I point out in this book is that Palestine is by no means a unique case. There have been many wars to impose a settler colonial project on an indigenous population. 
uh, the examples start right here where we're standing in Manhattan. They include the United States, they include Australia, they include Algeria, Kenya, South Africa, and many other places. One of the several peculiar aspects of this war against the Palestinians was that the settlers did not come from the metropole. They were not British subjects from Britain. They were not French people uh, from France, as was the case in Algeria. Uh, they were not British, as was the case in North America or in Kenya. Instead, the Zionist movement drew its settlers mainly from the persecuted Jewish populations of Eastern and Central Europe. In this respect, it was unique. Also, unlike most other settler projects, the Zionist movement wanted its independent sovereign state. Um, that's clear from uh, uh, Theodor Herzl's 1896 book, Der Judenstaat, in which he talked about an exclusively Jewish state. In other words, Zionism was a na nascent national movement in the modern sense at the same time that it was a self-described settler colonial project. Additionally, as we all know, there was an ancient biblical connection between Judaism and Palestine, which meant that Zionism could plausibly claim that it was reviving Jewish sovereignty uh, rather than establishing an entirely new entity. So I suggest in this book that for all the similarities, Zionism and, and, and Palestine constitute a unique case of settler colonialism. Um, this colonial movement, the Zionist movement, which aimed to found a new national entity in Palestine uh, and has succeeded in doing so, was in some sense independent of its great power patrons. It needed those patrons, but it was not, these were not French people from France or English people from England. This was, a, this was a separate and independent movement. This was a great strength of the Zionist movement and made it, as I've argued, quite different from any other settler colonial project. But a settler colonial project it always was. Indeed, for decades, from the time of Herzl until the 1940s, the Zionist movement openly and proudly described itself as colonial in nature. The first settlements, the first dozens of settlements, were established by the Jewish Colonial uh, Colonization Agency. That was the name that was given to the, the most important financial instrument of the establishment of these colonies. And uh, the, the word was not considered uh, 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 shameful or something to be embarrassed of back in the 20s or the 30s or the 40s. It was only after World War II uh, that, this, uh, uh, th that there was a change. After the, uh, colonialism went out of fashion uh, in the global era of decolonization. And also after the outbreak of a bitter conflict between Britain and the Zionist movement when the British curved their commitments to Zionism during World War, during, before and during World War I. In this book, I've tried to make this largely unknown story uh, accessible to American readers. And I try and do this by telling in stories of individual Palestinians, people who played different roles at various stages of their country's history. I've drawn material from autobiographies, I've drawn material from little known or unpublished documents, and I've included some from members of my own family in Jerusalem, such as the memoirs of my uncle, uh, Dr. Hussein al-Khaldi, or my aunt, Ambara Salam al-Khaldi. These both are published memoirs in Arabic, which are inaccessible to English language readers. I open the book with an incident that occurred in 1899, when an ancestor of mine, a great, great uncle of mine, by the name of Yusuf Bia al-Khaldi, who had served in the Ottoman parliament as the deputy for Jerusalem, and uh, for 10 years was the mayor of Jerusalem, wrote a letter to Theodore Herzl. In this letter, he warned against the implementation of the Zionist program for Palestine, which he understood very well. It's a multi-page letter. He goes into great detail. He explains that he understands the persecution Jews are subject to. He understands the connection of Jewish people to the land of Palestine, but he warns him Herzl against implementing the Zionist program. He said, you can't do this because this country is already inhabited. Its inhabitants would never agree to be superseded. He concluded his letter with the words, and I'm quoting uh, Yusuf Dhiya, for the sake of God, leave Palestine alone. This was a letter in 1899. Herzl replied immediately, and needless to say, Herzl ignored this appeal. Now, using this kind of story, 
uh, based on personal narratives, uh, based on documents that I've found, based on published uh, biographies and autobiographies, including in some cases from members of my own family, and including in some cases from the 60s onwards, my own observations of, of, of events. Uh, I, I've tried to describe the conflict in terms of five phases when this war was declared anew on the Palestinian people. But one of the things you have to understand is this war has never really stopped. The five phases I described mark changes in the nature of the war. But really for a hundred years this war has been going on, at a low level sometimes, at a high level sometimes. Uh, and it is going on to this day with bulldozers, with Trump and Netanyahu, uh, with uh, things that we don't see, legal tricks which force people out of their homes uh, and so forth. It's all part of this low-grade war which occasionally flares up. Let me just mention the five phases and then I'll go into them in a little more detail. The first started with the Balfour Declaration of 1917 and the subsequent mandate given to Britain uh, for Palestine by the League of Nations. That was the first phase of the war. The second phase was marked by the 1947 Partition Resolution passed by the UN General Assembly and the subsequent Nakba, or catastrophe, that struck Palestinian society during the 1948 war. The third phase, or the third stage, was the 1967 war and its sequel, a UN Security Council Resolution 242, adopted in November of that year. The fourth phase was the Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the siege of Beirut in 1982. And the fifth phase, still ongoing, uh, was the repeated wars and the unending siege of the Gaza Strip. Now, one of the things that I tie these wars to in the book is the fact that they were often based on or resulted in international dis documents that are described as a series of declarations of war on the Palestinian people. That's not how they're commonly understood. The first of these was the Balfour Declaration and the 1923 Mandate for Palestine. I describe that as the declaration of war on the Palestinian people. Why? Because these two documents, the, De the Balfour Declaration and the Mandate, established political and national rights in Palestine for the Jewish people, while the 94% of the population, the Palestinian Arabs, who were, were never mentioned by name in the document and are only described as non-Jews, the word Palestinian the word Arab doesn't occur in either the, the, the Balfour Declaration or the Mandate, whereas the Jewish people and their rights are extensively uh, laid out in these documents. This discriminatory framework remained in place uh, for the three plus decades of British rule in Palestine until 1948. Now, these documents in effect constituted a constitutional structure, uh, an internationally sanctioned constitutional structure that enabled Britain to impose a mainly European settler population with national objectives on the indigenous population. The aim of the British was crystal clear. They intended to hold the Palestinians down until the Jewish population became a majority. Britain successfully managed this process of holding the Palestinians down until the Great Palestinian Revolt of 1936-39, to 39, during which the British lost control of much of the country for a short period. Britain's repression of this, report, of this revolt was one of the most massive counterinsurgency campaigns of the entire interwar period. Britain brought in air power, Britain brought in two army divisions, created a force of over 100,000 soldiers and policemen, which amounted to one soldier for every three adult male Palestinians. An enormous, an enormous military force given the size of the country. The results of this repression for the Palestinians were devastating. 10% of the Palestinian Arab adult male population were either killed or wounded or imprisoned or exiled during this revolt of 1936 to 1939. So that was the first declaration of war, the Balfour Declaration and the Mandate. The second of these declarations of war uh, was the General Assembly's Partition Resolution of 1947. This resolution offered most of a country that, had a, that it still had a 66% Arab majority as a state for the 33% Jewish minority, including most of the fertile lands in Palestine at a time when Jewish ownership amounted to under 7% of the land of the country. We see in the Trump-Netanyahu plan uh, 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 a, a, an offer of compensation for the assets of Jewish populations who had to leave or were driven out of Arab countries. There's no mention 
of compensation for the 96% of the land of Palestine, which was the possession of the indigenous population. It's not even mentioned in the Trump plan or the Trump Netanyahu plan or the Trump Kushner Netanyahu plan. Call it what you will. Um, very soon after the resolution was passed, war followed. Even before the British left in May 1948, even before Israel was declared, the independence of the state of Israel was declared, even before the Arab armies entered Palestine in May 1948, over 300,000 Palestinians had been driven from their homes or had fled in terror in the face of a Zionist offensive that conquered the Arab part of Haifa, the Arab part of Jaffa, and the Arab parts of West Jerusalem, as well as scores of towns and villages. The Israeli army then successfully waged the subsequent phase of the war against four much weaker Arab armies with the diplomatic and military support of both the US and the USSR. By the end of the war, Israel had conquered 78% of the entire country. So that was the second declaration of war. Partition resolution was not a, uh, was not a impartial, objective international document. The, the, the partition resolution was the basis for a war which devastated Palestinian society, ended up uh, uh, over a, major, a majority of which uh, ended up as refugees. The third declaration of war came in 1967. This war produced a document that established the international parameters for dealing with Palestine. This was UN Security Council Resolution uh, 242 of November 1967. Once again, as in 1917, the Palestine issue was reduced to an insignificant level. Once again, the Palestinian people were not even mentioned by name. Palestinians don't exist in 242. The Palestine question doesn't exist in 242. 242 treats the entire conflict as a state-to-state -state conflict between Israel and Arab countries. Instead, the resolution speaks of, quote, a just solution of the refugee problem. That's the entire reference to the Palestinians. And in that, even in that, UN Security Council Resolution 242 did not even deign to mention which refugee problem it was referring to. The refugee problem is what the resolution says. As with the Balfour Declaration in 1917, in 1967, Security Council Resolution 242 uh, uh, simply erased the Palestinians and uh, treated them as if they did not exist as a political or national entity. This document has been, become the basis of the management of the conflict in the Middle East in favor of Israel for the past half century. I do not use the term peacemaking for 242 because it did not produce peace. There's still a conflict 53 years later. Indeed, it was not meant to produce peace by its drafters any more uh, than is the Trump Netanyahu plan that was released yesterday intended to bring peace. They have entirely different objectives. Both the Balfour Declaration and UN Security Council Resolution 242 served an essential purpose of the Zionist movement. This was to obliterate international mention of the presence of the indigenous Palestinian Arab population of the country. In its place, there was to be only a state of Israel and an Israeli people. The book shows how, since Herzl, this erasure has been a constant objective of the Zionist movement and then of the State of Israel and its supporters. Now, one of the things I point out in the book is that contrary to some narratives which reduce this to a conflict between Arabs and Jews or Palestinians and Israelis, um, it's important to note that all of these declarations of war were issued by the great powers and by international instances like the League of Nations or the General Assembly and Security Council of the UN, even if the wars on Palestine and the Palestinians were waged by different military forces. These include British troops. These included Zionist militias before 1948, later on the Israeli army, two major Arab armies, the Syrian, the Lebanese, uh, three major Arab armies, the Syrian, the Lebanese, and the Jordanian, and finally, Lebanese militias. Uh, so the war was waged by different parties, but the, the, the declarations were made by international bodies. So to continue talking about the 1967 war, um, we now have both official American documents and Israeli accounts, which show clearly that the 1967 war was grounded in, was based on American-Israeli collusion, whereby with President Johnson's assent, 
uh, in May 1967, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara gave the chief of Israelis, Israel's Mossad intelligence agency a green light for Israel's preemptive attack of June 1967. Th this was collusion. This was naked collusion, and it's available in for foreign relations of the United States, the official documentary record of the U.S. government, and in uh, accounts uh, by uh, Israeli participants in these decisions. So that was the third declaration of war, 1967. The fourth declaration of war took place in 1982. Here again, the war was preceded by U.S.-Israeli collusion in the form of a clear green light that was provided to, to Israeli Defense Minister Ariel Sharon by Secretary of State Alexander Haig during a meeting in May 1982, a few weeks before the war was launched. This was the first war since 1948 that was directed primarily against the Palestinians rather than involving mainly Arab states as was the case in 56, 67, and 73. This was a Israeli-Palestinian war. But the Americans were also involved, as I argue in the book. In this chapter of the book, uh, as in the 67 chapter, uh, I rely on documents and memoirs, uh, U.S. government documents, memoirs of people who were involved, uh, President Johnson's memoirs, but also uh, on my own personal recollections. I was in the visitor's gallery of the Security Council, where, which is where my father worked as a, as a member of the UN Secretariat, at the time of the ceasefire call, one of the ceasefire resolutions passed at the end of the 67 war, and I describe what happened. Uh, I lived later on in Beirut during the siege of that city in 1982. Uh, in the case of the 1982 war, I relied in part on research I did for an earlier book entitled Under Siege, which analyzed uh, PLO decision-making on the basis of documents that I obtained access to in Tunis after the war. Um, but as I say, I also rely on my own experiences and my own observations. In this chapter, in the 1982 chapter, I particularly focus on U.S. responsibility for the Sabra and Shatila massacres of uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of Palestinian and Lebanese, uh, Palestinian refugees and poor Lebanese Shia who lived in the Sabra and Shatila camps. Um, I, 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 I talk about U.S. responsibility because the United States had issued solemn official guarantees for the safety of the population of these camps after the withdrawal of PLO forces, uh, 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 guarantees that of course were never faithfully honored. Uh, and I lay a great deal of stress on this. Uh, this is one of the reasons that I call this an American-Israeli war. It's not just an Israeli war. It's not just Lebanese militias that actually did the killing. It's not just the Israelis that provided the flares that illuminated the killing. It's not just the Israeli army that drove them into the camps and uh, uh, escorted them out. Uh, it was the United States that was also directly responsible. Uh, on the basis of documents, this is not my personal opinion. Uh, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wealth of documentary uh, evidence for some of the things that I'm arguing here. 45 pages of footnotes for those of you who are interested in footnotes. Um, <clears throat> in this chapter, I also cite never-before-published documents from the secret annexes to the uh, Israeli Kahan Commission, which inquired into the Sabra and Shatila massacres. These documents reveal, reveal the complicity of the United States in what happened, uh, it reveals how little the United States did to uh, 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 remain faithful to the pledges for the safety of the civilian population that it had offered. And it also, th these documents also reveal the role of the Lebanese forces and, of course, of Israel in this tragedy. So that's the fourth war, the 1982 war. The fifth and final war that I chronicle in this book is the series of wars that have been waged against Gaza as well as the ongoing siege of the Gaza Strip. Now, the siege is a joint Israeli-Egyptian-American undertaking, but the wars on Gaza could not be carried out without U.S. military aid and U.S. diplomatic support. Like 1982, this phase of this Hundred Years' War is therefore, in some sense, an Israeli-American war on the Palestinians. So if we find Trump taking Israeli positions in his peace plan, nothing should surprise us. This is not the first time that Israel and the United States have waged war on the Palestinians or have declared war on the Palestinians or have ignored the Palestinians uh, in their actions. Now, this book does more than just talking about settler colonialism or talking about the great power's role in this war. It also describes the successes and failures of Palestinian efforts to resist this 
series of offensives on, on them. Um, whether these, uh, 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 this resistance took the form of attempts to defend Palestine with arms during the mandate period, or the rise of the PLO in the 1960s and 70s, or the PLO's successful diplomatic campaigns in the 1970s and 80s, or finally the first intifada, which started in 1987. Um, I argue in the book that the PLO's diplomatic offensive, which gave the Palestinian cause its first international platform, which gave the Palestinian cause its first widespread international support, uh, together with the first intifada, were the most successful episodes of resistance uh, it, uh, by the Palestinian people uh, to their dispossession and to the war being waged against them. In this book, uh, I, I draw lessons for the future from these episodes and also from episodes of failure, episodes where the Palestinians failed to defend their rights, efforts where their resistance was misguided, efforts where their leadership uh, uh, was not up to the task. Um, uh, I think all of these episodes, the failures and the successes, can be studied in order to devise uh, new strategies for the Palestinian people and a new way out of the uh, uh, imbroglio that we're in today. Mm -hmm.